Hello and welcome to Banaslo Library where we're uh, having a panel today on behalf of at the uh, Banaslo Comic Con virtually and uh, my name is Maura McHugh and we're going to be talking about graphic artists and graphic writers and I have uh, two very esteemed guests with me, and I'll actually get them to introduce themselves and, and tell us a little bit about their background. I'm Melanie, and um, I'm a writer and illustrator based in Westport. I started writing and drawing comics about five or six years ago. I did a master's in the University of Cornwall, and that's when I kind of started to write and draw. It was in authorial illustration, and that's when I started to write and draw my own my own stories. I'm Ashwin Jacko, a positively playful illustrator and uh, visual storyteller. I'm originally from India, and I moved to Ireland five years ago. I used to work in um, advertising as a graphic designer, and then over the years I've moved into illustration full-time. I also worked as a colorist on The Phantom, um, the limited series in Ireland. Oh, wow, really great. Um, I'm a, more a, I'm a writer. Um, I've worked in a bit of theatre, film, comic books, prose. Um, I'm doing some work for uh, Outsider Games in Belfast. I'm, uh, Jennifer Wilde's uh, a computer game, which is based on a comic that I wrote. And uh, yeah, I love uh, working and collaborating with artists. Actually, it's a really great, it's a really great thing to do. Um, so I just think we'll kick things off generally um, and just start again with Melanie. When you said you did a master's, but where did you? When did you really have a love of art? Like, does that come from when you were a kid? Yes, definitely. Um, my grandfather was an illustrator, so he actually made a cartoon, he was a cartoonist really, every day for the evening press. So he was a full-time civil servant, but every day after dinner he'd draw a cartoon, which would then appear in the evening press the next morning, and he'd drop it on his way into the um, office. And he did that for 40 years, so that was a huge memory of mine was my granddad drawing upstairs in his study. And he had all the Tintins and he had shelves full of like Chaz Adams, which was the Adams Family comics, which most people won't remember. But um, so I was really influenced by just seeing him draw our every day. So it obviously stuck with me and then came out a few years later. So. <laughs> but it's kind of interesting because not many people would have the idea that you could make a career out of it at a young age. Most people. I don't know, Aslan, did you think that when you were growing up that this was something you could do as a career? Well, I, I remember the story of when I was five or six. My mom retells the story of me asking her if I could make drawing a living. Of course, at the time, she was like, I don't know, we'll see, you know? Uh, she wasn't discouraging, but uh, it... Well, my idea of an artist was a starving artist, and I was ready to make that sacrifice. Yeah. But uh, I, th I think time has changed so much and has evolved so much that so many careers are possible that weren't possible back then. Yeah, actually, it's interesting. We, we say this because um, the filmmaker David Lynch started as an artist, and it wasn't until he, he said he always thought a painter was someone who painted walls. Yeah. And it wasn't until he met a friend of his whose father was a full-time artist, and he said it was like a light bulb went off in his head. And it was like, wow, I can, I can make a <laughs> living at this. And, and then from that moment on, he said, that's all I wanted to do, was to be an artist. So I really think knowing you can do it makes a lot, because when I was growing up, um, I liked telling stories, but they were kind of more for myself. And I never even imagined I would write comics, and mm. I read comics a lot when I was a kid. Um, but that has changed completely now. Where the idea you can make a career out of out of it, it's uh, I think it's really uh, really important that everyone gets a sense that they can go into this as a you know as a as a career. And your 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 grandfather, did you actually see this sort of magical process of? him being up in the room and then seeing it in the newspapers. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah, like my parents would have always, my dad would have always gotten the evening press every day and read it. And the first thing you do would be check granddad's cartoon every day. And my dad actually used to read them before he met my mom even. He 
like read the cartoons and then when he read my met my mom he realized he'd been you know reading her dad's cartoons for his whole life so wow. yes yeah, it's it is interesting it's a nice legacy yeah and do you have any of the original well they're actually all in the national library wow. we donated them so all the originals um because there's just so many of them so they're all yeah. just in the national library and being did you, cared for did this kind of put you off maybe because it was in your family or did you did well, just have my family are very artistic my, my mom has um seven sisters and one brother and they all do something like not as a career but paint or draw or ceramics um so i think it was just something we always did but um you know my granddad was a civil servant he did work nine to five monday to friday at a different job so i didn't really think that you could like make a living out of this as such but I knew it was something that people did was put words and pictures together. So how did you end up getting into the it, you decided, no, I do actually want to go into this area. Well, I did a degree in, um, in what they call visual communications, which mm -hmm. is graphic design, really, um, at IADT. And then, as I said, I, a few years later, I went back to Cornwall and I did a master's in authorial illustration. And that's kind of when it all started to make sense to me, really, was because before that I thought an illustrator is just someone who draws pictures. But when I did the authorial illustration, I was encouraged to write my own things. And then I realized, OK, wait, so you can draw and write. That's a, you're allowed to do that. <laughs> and I was, so then that's when I started to write my own picture books. And um, when you kind of get taken seriously and you get respect, it really encourages you. Yeah. So, Ashwin, how did you? So, you wanted to. So, you were drawing from the age of five or something. Yeah, probably <laughs> earlier than that. <laughs> I wouldn't. I wouldn't say amazingly, but I was doing it. Um, yeah, I. I started off in art, and then, much like Manly, I studied visual communications. Um, uh, uh, and then I transitioned from visual communications into animation and multimedia, because. Uh, uh, the VizCom course that I was doing was very uh, theoretical after the first year and I was like, there's no point in doing this because at the end of this, I need a portfolio to get a job. Mm -hmm. um, and then I ended up studying animation and multimedia. And what I loved about that course was, uh, it made me realize that animation wasn't for me. It was like super tedious, but I loved the storyboarding aspect and that pushed me more towards comics. Yeah. So all my f first projects in, in uni were um, comic projects. So each one, I, I finished a book for each semester. Oh, and wow. uh, That's that amazing. got me, re really pushed me into doing more comics. From there, I went into doing graphic design because it's tough to get a job as a comic book artist in India. Um, <laughs> and. So I ended up doing graphic design for a couple of years before I moved here and worked as an art director in, um, in advertising. And then coming here, I had the realization that illustration is a career on its own where you could just draw and work with advertising to do that because I had to hire yeah. illustrators to work on <laughs> campaigns and stuff. You're like, <laughs> so I was like, I can do this now. <laughs> so then over the next few years, I've been pushing into becoming a full-time illustrator. Oh, I mean, I, I think it's very interesting about you. I mean, when you were making these books, uh, it wasn't part of the course. It was just something you wanted to do. Yeah, okay. yeah, exactly. Yeah. So we got to pick our our final projects, and it could be anything as long as it had either drawing or film or some form, uh, some aspect of that. And so this combined. Uh, the pre-production aspect of animation mm -hmm. as well as the pre-production aspect of filmmaking. Yeah. And so comic it's, books I, kind I of runs. I think this is really interesting because a lot of artists I have worked with have come via animation or film and they did a lot of storyboarding. And what I've noticed is that artists who do have that discipline, that they can convey something which is quite difficult in comics, which is dynamic action and they're particularly skilled at that I've noticed and being able to break down the narrative in such a way that you know the story goes along on a good uh, clip because one of the things for me as a writer is I mean comics are actually quite technical 
and they require a good sense of structure. So you have to, um, everything is broke, broken down based on the pages, you have to know how many pages you're going to do, you have to construct the story around that, then you also think about page turns, um, and because you usually start with the page on the right is the first page, so scenes often naturally occur in three, two, five, you know, that kind of, and then these are all the things, so your story is very much set around boundaries and construction, constructing um, the story in this certain kind of way, so um, and I was lucky, I did a lot of art actually when I was a kid, and uh, I uh, still draw, so I think very visually, so I don't know, it would be interesting to talk to both of you about this, but for me, I can't actually start to write the comic until I have a visual in my head of, even if the artist doesn't do exactly, but for me to write it, I need to have a visual in my mind of how I'm going to lay the page out, how I'm going to break down the story page by page. How do you find that? Because you eventually went into comics, not to jump. Jump ahead. You've made some yourself as well. Yeah, yeah, definitely. It's my uh, favorite medium. It's definitely comics. Um, <laughs> yes, <laughs> everyone should read more comics. Yeah, for sure. Um, so yeah, usually when I come, up, it's usually a story that I come up with first, and then I, as you say, usually get these kind of flash of very strong images, and I usually just try and jot those down on paper as quickly as possible, what I call a mind dump. I just dump everything out of my mind onto the page. And then I usually have to actually write the story, as you say, sit down and actually figure out so what's going to happen. Do you write a full script now? Or no, I don't write a script because I find it difficult to separate words and pictures. So I usually try and write, a, you know, maybe A4 or two A4 pages of what's actually going to happen. Mm -hmm. And then I just take my cheap photocopier paper, sit down and just start drawing really rough pictures and images together, which I change and change and change. and. I don't do any, you know, final until I'm yeah. really happy with it. Alright, so you do a lot of refining. Yeah, definitely a lot, yeah. Alright, oh, that's interesting. Keep going, keep going. So do you start with just rough thumbnails and then go further and further along? No, I kind of, I, I also can't picture things small, so, <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, so I usually just do full size on my A4 photocopier yeah. paper, just really quick and I just throw it out if I'm not happy or rub it out and just start again, mm -hmm. but I, I can't, I know loads of people say they thumbnail the whole thing in a, in a notebook, but I have to see a real size, I can't work That's still. actually really interesting, because that's a great point to make to people, is that every artist and writer has their own system. Oh yeah, So definitely. it could be weird if you start to think, oh, I have to thumbnail everything, what's wrong with me, mm. you know? But, you, but it's great that you figured out, no, I'm just doing it this way. <laughs> Yeah. Well, this is what works for me. So how's your process? Do you do any kind of uh, writing at all or do you just let it, the art bring you along? It really depends on the story. Sometimes I have the story formed in my head and I'll write that out and then start messing around with the characters and then thumbnailing pages out. Or I'll have a character that I've just really loved drawing and then I start building the character up. And once I understand the character, that then lends itself to a story. Mm -hmm. And so I might have drawn a few variations or a few scenes with the character and some of the other um, uh, you know, protagonists within the realm that I'm building. Mm -hmm. um, and then that leads me to write a dialogue or a script for it. Yeah, yeah. And then, mean, yeah. <coughs> yeah, I think it's one of the things that's really important about comic book writing is yeah, writers are always having to be mindful of, uh, this is the way I look at it, which is uh, dialogue sits on top of nice art. <laughs> so, you know, you should be very economical, but you then weirdly have to, I mean, I've caught myself um, perhaps uh, editing too much, you know, where you're removing too much dialogue, because it actually is necessary sometimes. <laughs> um, but it's the amazing thing with artists, I mean, from the beginning, you have to think about where you're placing your dialogue, don't you? Yeah, 100%. It's, uh, it'll help you construct the, the panels because obviously you want to space it so that you don't have dialogue blocking off a whole, whole section of, of the art. Um, 
uh, funnily enough, I, I don't think too much about page structure when I'm writing out the dialogue. I just write the whole story and then I go back and then I'll, I'll break down the dialogue into pages and be like, okay, this will be a good conversation on this page, this page. Yeah. So I, I construct it like that. Oh, yes, that's really interesting. <laughs> and again, it, it helps because it's, I mean, it's different in this regard because you're both your writer and your artist, you know, where I'm generally just the, just the uh, writer. I actually did a residency in Angoulême in France um, in a few, a few years ago and uh, I was with a group of 20 artists and I had to write, draw, letter, everything, <laughs> my own comic in 10 days. And uh, boy, it gave me a much a great appreciation uh, <laughs> for all the artists I work with and the letterers and the colorers because I had to do everything myself. Um, do you do your own lettering in your comics? Do you do everything when you're doing them? Yeah, de I do everything and I've, I've heard the quote recently that writing a graphic novel is a very cheap way to make a film. Which makes a lot of sense because you're the writer, you're the costumier, you're the actor, you're the director, and that's personally that's what I want my own vision. So, yeah, that's I think that would be me continuing on. I I think I'd find it very hard to work with someone else's words, and everyone's different. That's that's the beauty of it. Yeah, I was actually just going to ask you: Do you ever think of working with someone else? Maybe in the future, but I just have so many projects myself that I want to finish. So. And I, everyone finds their own balance. So personally, I have a part-time job so that I don't have financial pressure on me to, to create work. So I try and just drive my own projects because they're, re they're really important to me to kind of, I'm very opinionated basically. Yeah. And do, do you, um, is there any part of it you prefer? Like, do you like hate lettering or sometimes love it? Or I don't oh. put much emphasis on those things. Like, I, I think the story is the main thing and I really, I'm, I work a lot to try and convey emotions and feelings mm. and that's what I want to create atmosphere and I wouldn't be worried about lettering, like it wouldn't be something I'd ever consider. I just make my own typefaces scan in my own handwriting, bam, there it is, and it wouldn't be something that I'd be concerned with. Okay, so you work on the page, you, do you work digitally at all? I do the lettering digitally, but I try and draw my own, sometimes I might, like sometimes I make stories where the colour is digital, mm -hmm. um, and I scan in my own work, my own sketching, but I I'm not someone who spends hours on each page. It's more important for me to create an overall atmosphere and everything, so I wouldn't like be worrying about perfect, perfect color or anything. I'm, I'm just trying to create an overall piece. So. Uh, yeah. What about yourself? Do you have a process, part of the process you love, or do you find a bit like, oh, grind, grind? <laughs> <laughs> I suppose uh, the toughest part is getting the panels right so that there's good visual flow um, and so that, that's really the story story uh, telling aspect it's, it's building up the story in a way that that makes sense and then the colors have such a vital role in in comic books because they can evoke mood they can change scenes um, you could just have a color a specific color scheme for a specific um, uh, setting and so when they change or they turn the page over without saying it in words, you're saying it in colors. Yeah. And so yeah. I think the colors are such an important aspect and for me. And did you find your time working on a, a, another project, but you're doing the coloring, how did you find that? What did it, did it teach you stuff when you did? Yeah, I, I, I love working with other people's stuff as well, because it, you see just like the pencil sketches or just the inks mm -hmm. and then uh, as you color it in, it suddenly comes to life, and the characters have flesh and tone, and mm -hmm. you know you get to create the color palette for a character mm -hmm. and uh, for specific scenes. And then the best part is actually seeing it in print. You know, you get that fresh copy, and you open it for the first time, and uh, there's no better feeling than that. Yeah. Did you ever have where the artist said to you, as the colorist, "Oh, could you do roughly X or Y color? Like, do you?" I think people don't appreciate that um, colorists and artists often actually communicate. 
Um, for this, that particular project, The Phantom, I didn't have any back and forth. It was, I was pretty much given free reign, which was fantastic. <laughs> best thing that you can do. Um, and so would you like to work in other projects, like say work for hire or, or working with a big company or are you happy doing your own, your own pieces? So I, I've actually moved away from comics now. I primarily now work in the children's book uh, space. So illustration. Yeah, illustration. So I'm, uh, I released my book, What Wondrous Shapes We Are, in 2020. Um, and then there's three new books in the works with various publishers. So. Yeah. And are you writing them as well as? I, I write and illustrate the them. The whole thing? Yes. Oh, excellent. Yeah. Well, that's my preference. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And actually, this really interesting question about illustrations. You also, or you're continuing to do illustration, I assume. How do you find, like, uh, when I was a kid, I remember graduating from books that were illustrated over to books that had occasional illustrations up to full, full blown novels without illustrations and as a kid I found a sort of like a little trepidation about be, being in a book without without any visuals you know I, I found that it was almost like becoming a grown-up or something but it also felt uh, like being unanchored in some way I mean what is your what do you love about doing illustrations and do you write your own projects that you're working on yeah, I, I wrote a picture book which is called The Mountain That Moved, so I wrote and illustrated it. It's published by Badly Made Books and it's about a mountain that is lonely, so he decides to become an island um, and I really enjoyed working on that and the book is, is an eco fable, so it's risograph printed um, with soy based inks on recycled paper, so it's a perfect fit for Badly Made Books and it's a really nice story, so you should go on the website if anyone wants a copy. Um, but yeah, I loved working on, on that as well, and it's just a way of, I think it's so satisfying when you see children reading it as well, and just, there's definitely just something really satisfying about reaching a young audience as well, and I've had such good feedback about it, so I think that's something I've really enjoyed. I don't know about you, Ashwin, is it, do you find that satisfying if you see somebody getting something from your book or yeah for sure um i have done quite a few um visits to schools well online virtual visits and and you get to read your book and and do a fun activity and you know like the joy you see on their faces mm -hmm. and and which character they like the best and yeah. obviously kids have no filter so they'll tell yeah. you exactly how they feel about <laughs> what characters and and that's the best part you know it, it their books are great because um each person is left free to interpret a lot of the stuff in it especially picture books yeah and how do you like what's your how do you know what picture you're going to use per text like do you know that so when you're creating the book do you start you start with the text first, or some images, or how, how's that process versus comics? I, again, I start with the text first. But sometimes a character can um, evoke the text, but I, I like to write out the whole story. Mm -hmm. And then once I've written out the story, I work out um, what lines will go on which pages. Mm -hmm. And again, this it's pretty structured for children's book. It's 32 pages, yeah. um, usually 12 to 14 double page spreads mm -hmm. and so then it's just a question of working out um, the rough sketches or thumbnails as it were yeah placements yeah, yeah. yeah. and do you do you spend so it must be you spend a lot more time on those images than you would necessarily for sort of comics you know because it's got such drama impacts those pieces um I'd say comic books are much more labor intensive because um, with a picture book it's just one spread mm -hmm. um, and, I'm, and you can do very little or loads yeah. on that spread and you have complete flex over there. With comic books there's so much more structure, you have to be very careful about your panels, how wide they are, how fast they are because that also has to do with timing mm -hmm. and, and pace of the comic. Mm -hmm. and so. Uh, what you can achieve in, say, a month, you could quickly finish off a couple of, like, 
a, a picture book, but I think it'll take a couple of months to do yeah. one comic book. Yeah, I mean, uh, the standard rate in comics is one page a day if you're the artist. And yeah. that, for a graphic novel that's 64 pages or something, that is a lot of time. And uh, that's why so many people have to work part time and, and be an artist for a long time before they can get to a point where they can make a living. Uh, uh, making comics. I mean, it is possible, but boy, <laughs> for most of us, uh, you know, we, uh, we, a lot of us are still doing gigs on the side yeah. and, you know, teaching or whatever, um, because that's just the reality of being a creative person. Um, and and your so your picture, the both of your picture books. What age groups is it considered up to that picture books are kind of the target area? I think it's about, I think it changes all the time yeah. now because you have people like Sean Tan that just oh, kind of, okay. yeah, and they have no, you know, specific age group. They have, they kind of defy uh, genres and so I think it's technically up, like up to eight or something, but I yeah. think there's always work that defies that and is very successful. Yeah. I think they can stretch up to 12 and they're usually broken up into smaller sections within that as well. There's yeah, like yeah. zero to four years old, um, which would be mainly board books and that yeah. sort of, and then from five to eight, mm -hmm. or tw and then from eight to 12, you know. And, and what kind of age groups roughly have you worked for? Like you, have you done like the board books or you're done like older kids? I haven't done the board books. I think mine is probably, yeah, up to about probably six to eight, yeah. but can be really read by anyone. Of course, everyone everyone gets something from a picture book. I think it's yeah. just, there's so many beautiful books out there now, so. Mm -hmm. And do you find the adults like your books as well? Yeah, I, uh, <laughs> they're usually with the child as well, often they do. I, I tend to create books like I would be reading them, um, and I have three kids of my own, so that's what motivated me to go into children's books. Uh, so I did this ABC with fruity characters um, picture book a while back and that really had m most of the jokes for like the adults like mm -hmm. the I had so each alphabet had a corresponding um, fruit that went with it and the fruit had a character so for instance there was like dicey dragon fruit and it's this guy with his coat out and he has like candy bars in there and it's like uh, a poke at, you know, like uh, old school 80s uh, comics where they'd have like the guy selling drugs there. <laughs> but this is candy bar for kids. You know? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. There's, and do you find you do that as well? But you're, you, you keep, you, like, you're aiming for the child, but you're also maybe thinking, ooh, adults might be reading this as well. Yeah, I think subconsciously you always put in those jokes um, that probably go over the head of some children and I've heard people say, you know, children don't buy children's books, which is true, adults buy them for children, so you do have to appeal to adults as well, definitely, it's, um, yeah, it's a fine line anyway. <laughs> yeah, and both of you have done uh, sort of graphic design, so I presume you both do your covers as well. Do you? And, and do you uh, have to work with a publisher about that or do you get as much freedom as you like what to choose? That you, or do you, is that something you have to think a lot about what's going on the cover of the book? Yeah, definitely. It has to, um, it has to kind of either sell the book or reveal a story or it, it has a very specific job to do, like my children's picture book. I had the main character on the cover um, just because it was kind of a really obvious marker um, and it kind of explains the story in one really bright image but then when I'm working on my graphic novel now I'm gonna have a much more subtle cover because I um, have a mentor that I work with uh, in she's based in the UK and she was saying you know don't reveal the main plot twists so it's just two completely different jobs that the covers need to do there. So it's really it's really interesting and um, how it works. But I haven't had to compromise much so far. <laughs> do you look at trends at all in covers? Because there tends to be these weird trends that start happening in covers in publishing mainly. Do you ever look at that? No. no. 
<laughs> Not me. <laughs> what do you think about when you're doing it, trying to come up with a killer cover for your for your book? If it's a comic book versus if it's um, if it's a children's book, and when children's books, it's kind of like you want to get that key element off the book into the cover, mm -hmm. whether it is the idea behind it. So, for instance. Um, with the fruity characters, I had all the different characters around with hand letter typography mm -hmm. to to bring it to life because it's talking about those characters within. Um, versus uh, with comic books, you can be a lot more abstract. Yeah. You can play with like colors or tones and textures uh, with very little, mm -hmm. uh, and you're sort of almost drawing the reader in towards to pick it up and, yeah. and dig in. Do you work digitally? Yes. On the page, digitally. Yeah. I, I, I started off working traditionally and then I had the, the Wacom where I had to look yeah. at the screen and uh, with the introduction of the iPad Pro, mm -hmm. I've gone digital and I probably won't go look back <laughs> for any commercial work that is. Like, oh. I still like to draw traditionally for fun, yeah. uh, but when it comes to commercial work, just the flexibility you have with uh, a digital uh, pad and the kind of time frames because I work in advertising mm -hmm. the time frames are tend to be quite short mm -hmm. so it, it gives me enough flexibility to get jobs done really fast so you're still doing illustration work obviously for uh, clients let's just say so how do you find that I mean do you find the deadline is great because it pushes you to do you just have to do it I like working fast I uh -huh. uh, I don't like projects that drag along, um, and so I, that's why I really love advertising. It's it's got so much um, there's so much creative flex within a constraint. And most think most people think that like creativity is best when there is no constraints, but I think it flourishes most within tight constraints mm -hmm. because then you really have to push yourself creatively to make something work. Yeah. And uh, for me, that really works within advertising. You got kites and chains as far as branding, maybe even colors. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, as an illustrator, you establish your style, you establish your tone of voice. Mm -hmm. And so then brands come to you for that specific tone of voice and style. Uh, right. And I was, it was funny, I was going to say, have you ever, do you switch up your styles? very much, I mean, but I can see this would be for your, your client work would not necessarily be a good thing. Yeah, so the, initially when I first started out, I did a lot of messing around with different styles, but what happens with that is you're, you're not seen as um, established. Mm. I, I like to think of it as a, as a buffet, like if the client was going to a buffet, there's lots of different options and you know you never know what you're going to get, uh, but it's cheaper and uh, it's hit and miss. Whereas if you want something that's consistent and quality, you go to say a steakhouse because you know that's what they do day in, day out. Yeah. And for a business, um, they're looking for the least risky option. Mm -hmm. And so the more you can work towards making yourself look like the least risky option, mm -hmm the more likely they are to hire you. Yeah, but you, then you have your own work you do yourself. Yeah. It gives you your freedom yeah. to do exactly. your own. It sort of satisfies your soul. Exactly. Yeah. So Melanie, you still doing, are you still doing work like this as well for clients? Or are you? No. All, oh, it's all you. Yeah, just me. So I, I, like, if you want me to talk a bit about, as a business, how I survive. So Ashwin, obviously, he's talked, he does a lot of, we've, we see your, your work a lot, or it's, beautiful and um, so I'd say I'm the would be the opposite business model so as a as a how I work is that I yeah create my own comics um, and picture books and then I publish with small publishers or I self-publish and sell those to local um, galleries you know prints um, you know sell them online sell them in small bookshops um, or eco-friendly shops and then I also you know teach workshops um, and yeah that's how I kind of uh, fund myself and keep myself going so I'd say I have a different business model but it's such a big area there's, as you can see there's room for all kinds of people and all kinds of styles and 
and different ways of doing yeah. things. And do you, do you look at that, the style? Do you change your style depending on your project? Or do you have, you've, you've fallen into, and I don't mean this in any way, like you have a voice that you're happy with? I think, yeah, as I like, if you're working on a long comic book, whatever you do on page one, you have to be able to do that repeatedly over and over for 100 pages. So whatever you pick, it has to be. It's not your best drawing. It can't be your best work. It's something that you can repeat over and over. And then when you work on a picture book, for example, it's just 32 pages. So whatever you do, you can be a lot more playful because, you know, it's not, it's not, you don't have to keep doing it over and over and so yeah you get to be I think a bit more experimental and playful and when I made my images I made a lot of mixed media and cut and paste and acrylic and it was really really fun and I loved doing it so yeah I'd love to do another one soon but they're definitely you know different image making fits different purposes. Yeah. How have you found um now we all kind of work from home, I assume. Do you go into an office for the... Okay, so how did you find COVID? Did it or didn't it impact your health uh, Well, firstly, um, yeah, I was forced to kind of realise I live in the west of Ireland, I live in Westport, so I kind of realised that my connection or community was all Dublin based, like coming up to the DCAF, Dublin Comics Arts Festival. Yeah. And then I would get to sell my comics, meet people, talk about comics, which was great. But then obviously when COVID hit, that I realised I was quite cut off. So it forced me to, I did a lot of online courses. So I made contacts in the US. I did a course in a, a US college for a week um, remotely. I did another course with the UK organization and now I have a mentor base in the UK and I also set up my own comics collective that I meet on Zoom and we all live in different parts of Ireland, different backgrounds but we meet once a month and we just draw and talk for an hour and it's great so um, you know I think it had it personally it you know it had a good outcome and it made me look at how I was doing things but definitely um, did change how I work. Yeah I was actually working in a kosher space and I had made that decision because I had been working freelance in, in, in tech and in, uh, in writing for a long time. And I was like, this isolation, I think I need, <laughs> I need to get out <laughs> and make myself meet people. And uh, so actually, funny enough, when COVID came, I found it very difficult because I had taken a certain step mm -hmm. for my mental well-being <laughs> and then it was taken away from me. So, and then of course my husband was, he's a coder, he was, um, is, or I should say, excuse me, software engineer, <laughs> he was, um, we were both in the same house together, so it was quite challenging. But I think, like you're saying, is that you start to think about where is your network for me and most of my writer friends, like festivals are so important, conventions, it's where you meet your friends, and you hang out, and you mm -hmm. chat, and you get tips about who's to, you know, various things are exchanged. And it, so I did a lot more uh, reaching out to people, Zoom calls, or, or whatever, platform you want to use, Discord, etc. Um, and actually I'd probably end up being more in contact now with some of these people. How did you how did you find it with kids at home as well? <laughs> <laughs> I think COVID was uh, really good for me personally uh, in my own personal journey. You find that once you start a career, the tendency is you just start doing stuff to keep yourself going. It's survival mode almost. Yeah. Um, and then 2020 gave the opportunity for me to pause and really consider why do I do what I do and what sort of impact do I want to make? And through that process, I was able to discover my why, which was bringing joy and encouragement in everything I do. So that helped hone in my specific illustration style. It also helped me choose the sort of projects I wanted to go forward. And so giving me a very clear direction and purpose then allowed me to make the right type of connections to find growth and then also to build the type of projects. So um, community was a big aspect for that. So I started something called Illustrators Unite, where now we have a monthly um, meeting where uh, I invite different guests to teach so that lots of what I found is a lot of illustration illustrators work in isolation yeah. and so they don't know a lot of the, the business side of illustration which is so important for us to thrive yeah. 
And so this was an opportunity to share our knowledge and build the next generation up. Yeah, and you're part of the Illustrators uh, uh, Society, is it? Sorry. Illustrators yeah. Ireland. Mm -hmm. Illustrators Ireland, yes, pardon me, yes. Yeah, we both are. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, it's really good to have that support network and we have a great um, text and you know email chain. So if anyone comes across a problem in any way, they just pop off an email and a more experienced person will give them a little reply. It's really useful. It must be handy for the evil thing we have to deal with all the time, contracts. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's always good to have um, some society or group you can go to. There are numerous ones in the UK and Ireland who are are great for that or do either of you have an agent? Do you have an agent? No, I don't. I recently signed uh, an agent uh, in children's book, literary agent yeah. uh, called KSA. Ah, and are they based in the UK? Yes. I uh, thought so. Yeah. Yeah, but generally they are, yeah. Um, and how do you how do you network and sort of sell your book? Because like especially because you're self-published and, and working with small press uh, I work with lots of different small presses myself. How do you find that pressure to get your content out there? I mean, what do you use Twitter or Instagram? Or this is the, the brutal realities of our lives. <laughs> yeah, to be honest, recently I've had a bit of a backlash, a personal backlash, you know, against. It is, Instagram is a great way. I use it a lot to just put up images and meet people, but. Um, I definitely, because of COVID, I think I just got, I think like everyone, I just really overdid the old internet and Instagram. Mm -hmm. So I've been reading a book called Deep Work, which I got from the library. Yeah, um, <laughs> yeah. And I actually read a lot of graphic novels, which I get from the library. So talk to your librarian. Um, and it's guy, by a guy called Cal Newport, and it's just about concentrating and oh, yeah. the art of concentration. So I'm really trying to do that now, and I'm kind of organizing, organizing myself into kind of two hour blocks where I turn off my internet, turn off my Wi-Fi and I just try and really concentrate on what I'm doing and it's something, a skill I've had to build back up because I think I just spent so much time on the internet um, during Covid personally and I'm so I'm trying to kind of back away and just work with small businesses, meet people in person yeah, and if you can. Um, yeah, if yeah. you can, and yeah, I'm really absolutely. enjoying that. I, I mean, I totally agree with meeting in person. I think I had some friends now who were teaching all the time on Zoom, and they literally couldn't be in front of a computer unless they absolutely had to. Do you know what I mean? They just they found it almost like being triggered by <laughs> seeing a screen in front of them. I mean, how how do you publicize your work, and how do you find the social media? Because it's it's got its pros and its cons. I think social media is a fantastic tool. We live in a brilliant age where you can reach the customer directly. Uh, obviously prior to this I did a lot of local markets which was fantastic because you get to meet a lot of artists and you get to connect with the customer directly. But um, I think if you use social media well, uh, you can use it to your advantage. So for me personally, I use Instagram and LinkedIn a lot. Uh, Instagram is to build my general audience and community and the way I use it is very specific as well so I always like to give value so it's teaching and then also sharing your work and also then promoting other people as well yeah. so by having this prid quo quo prid quo quid pro quo there we go <laughs> <laughs> like, it's there <laughs> Yeah, uh, like it, it's it's amazing when you, when you share your knowledge, and a lot of the times you you don't think it's that important, yeah. but most people don't have your same experience, and just by the the fact that you're you're pushing somebody else to grow mm -hmm. um, allows them to then connect with you and and build yourself. So then when you end up putting out a book or anything, they want to support you regardless. Yeah, you know? yeah. I think it's really interesting how we use social media. Um, and, and, and I do think like uh, promoting other people is really good. I just have a rule for myself, personally, everyone does their own thing, but I never, if there's something I really hate, I never talk about it online. <laughs> my attitude is, it doesn't need my fire. Yeah, you know? yeah. I want to put my, my interest in projects I think are great and yeah. that need support and which I think are good. So that's just one of my little rules 
when I'm dealing with it. Interesting you mentioned LinkedIn because mm. that's something most people don't talk about as a social media and especially if you're a jobbing uh, freelance uh, illustrator I would just imagine because actually it's a very professional network and there's a lot less um, drama, <laughs> let's just say, <laughs> in those circles. It tends to be very laser focused on um, communicating information about your work. Yeah. Uh, I see myself not so much as a freelance uh, freelancer and more as a business owner. Uh, no, no, no worries. Uh, but uh, regarding LinkedIn, I think every creative should be on LinkedIn. The reality is, if you want to get work, you need to be thinking and working as a business. And where do all your clients live? They live on LinkedIn. They don't live on Instagram. Yeah. Um, and so you need to start making those connections and LinkedIn's fantastic because say you have a dream client mm. um, say it's Image Comics Image Comics will probably have their page but they'll also have the people who work under them so you yeah. could see the list of yeah. who's working within that company you could see the relevant art director you could start uh, a conversation with that specific art director. Mm -hmm. The trick is it's not just uh, a question of being known, it's being known by them, yeah. right? Yeah, and it's often, I think those people may be above, uh, like uh, Twitter is a very creative um, focus, the creatives are on Twitter, um, but there are agents and editors who don't want to be on Twitter, you know what I mean? They're like, no, um, especially if they've got lots of people <clears throat> that they're dealing with because they, um, uh, you know, there's a certain level of professionalism they need and they want a distance as well. Um, do you use LinkedIn at all or no? no not no. really, not, I yeah. think um, mainly Instagram to be honest. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I think but that's a great idea, I must update mine. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, when I went, um, like most people, I've had full, uh, you know, a part-time job while I was writing for a long mm -hmm. time. But when I went um, kind of full time just writing, I actually, the first thing I did was went onto my LinkedIn and updated everything on it. Um, and I now keep it um, pretty up to date. And like um, all the publishers and all the editors and all those people are up on there. And even if it doesn't, um, yeah, I just think it's a useful, a very useful um, contract. And I'd imagine if you're an illustrator, it would be particularly useful. Uh, uh, contact to have. I was just wondering what projects, like, is there like a dream project that you'd like to do at some point? Well, I'm working on a one graphic novel now and then I have an idea for another graphic novel and I have an idea that it would be a whole series, so oh, I don't know. We'll see. It's, I always dream big and then We'll see. Well, no, I think dreaming big is a great idea. Yeah, and, and you said you're working with a mentor. Yeah. Yeah, and how are you finding that? Brilliant. Oh, it's so good. One of the downsides of being an illustrator, writer, your own business, is that you're the only person kind of looking at things and reading them. So having someone with a fresh set of eyes, a different skill set, um, much more experience to ha look at your work is amazing. It's brilliant. Yeah. Wow. And have you ever worked with anyone like that? Well, you're obviously mentoring other people. <laughs> I'm mentoring other people, but that's always a two-way uh, thing. You learn as much from the other person. But I think it, uh, Melanie touches on a great point. It's so important to have um, somebody outside that you can have. Um, what I have is what I call it is a peak performance partner. And so yeah. this other friend of mine, uh, she's not in the same industry as me, as in she's graphic design, but not illustration. Yeah. But it's still handy to have someone you can talk about, the business who understands the creative industry, who can give you some advice, or even just their thoughts so you can then clarify your thinking yeah. as well. Yeah. So I think it's great to foster those relationships. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I, I think that's very good. I mean, I've just recently started doing a challenge this month, which was simply a prompt to write a poem every day. Mm. And uh, I'm doing it with a friend. And so what we're doing is we're at the, like once a week, we're chatting, uh, we're sending each other the stuff to each other, and then we're discussing it afterwards. And I don't do a lot of this kind of thing. But I do think it's useful to 
find ways to re-energize yourself, even if it's in a different, slightly different area than you mostly write. So poetry for me is a very almost esoteric thing. You know, it's not, it's not going to pay bills, that's <laughs> for sure. But it's something I enjoy doing. But also just that communicating with other people. Um, and then, you know, if a, a lot of people have writer groups or artist groups, which is like a small, in, you know, like a really small group of people. Do you have anyone like that or are you working on? Oh, you have your group, of course. Yeah, I'm actually in the Castle Bar Writers Group as well, though. So I am, um, yeah, because... Is that face to face? It was, and then we did Zoom, and I'm sure it'll be face to face soon. But um, yeah, so I have a few different outlooks and say for example reading my work in the writers group where um, nobody is particularly interested in, interested in comics is really useful because you get a com like kind of a completely different viewpoint so mm -hmm. yeah it's great to show it to as many people as possible I think actually. Yeah and as uh, well obviously um, networking and having people in the real world is very important I think when you're you know living out of your head for so much mm -hmm. it can be Oh, I don't know. I mean, I don't know, I and mean, this might be something people don't talk about very often, but do you, like, is there anything that you do, like, physically, like, go out and walk, or, you know, do you have something to get you out of the house? Oh, yeah, I, I have to do lots of outdoor activities. I do cycling. Long, um, if I can, I'll go, um, what's it called, um, bikepacking, oh, yeah. and then Prior to COVID, we used to have weekly rock climbing, so go rock climbing out, outdoors in um, Dunleary. Mm. Yeah, and what about yourself? Yep, yeah, I do. I if I I try and get out and go for a walk as much as possible, and I'm in the triathlon club, so oh, I is. yeah, so I do um, a lot of sea swimming. Uh, this is, has kind of come to an end now, but I definitely believe there's an, I don't like people have an image of suffering artists don't believe in that at all have completely lots of other stuff going on so it all feeds into everything you do doesn't it as well like you have to have a life to write about something so yeah yeah and i think that's maybe the the first lockdown certainly was kind of this weird scary period where we're all a bit like ah, can't even go outside <laughs> but yeah i do i i i walk i it, I have now a kind of a mandatory outdoors every day kind of uh, mm. schedule and uh, I listen to podcasts often and sometimes when the weather is bad that's what I do to make myself go out. <laughs> I'm like, oh, I'll listen to this podcast while I'm out uh, on those days or, or just enjoy the woods. I go to the woods a lot and that's a big source of inspiration for me in my fiction. <laughs> but I write a lot of horror, so <laughs> <Wow>. it <laughs> shouldn't be too surprising there. Um, and so if there's anything you'd like to just mention at the end, like a project you're working on currently that you would like to just mention, and this is, you know, if anyone wants to get your work, this is live at the moment. Mm. Well, I, I most recently self-published a book called The Little Optimist, A Pocket Full of Joy, oh, okay. and it's 30 days of creative meditation. So each page has a personal story, and a lovely illustration on the other side and so it's the idea is to keep you positive and uh, moving through your day with a positive outlook oh, that's uh, so perfect for, today, for this <laughs> era did you get the idea now or what, during covid or was it, it was uh for yeah it, it was motivated by it um so i had made a very conscious decision when I went online on Instagram and so on that I did not want to have anything negative um, on my feed and I didn't want to feed the negative engine that yeah. the internet can become so I made a very conscious point to talk about positivity and being optimistic yeah. and that then had a lot of people asking me questions like how do you stay positive in such dire circumstances or mm -hmm. when we there's so much unknown and so for me personally, that, that's because of my faith and um, the practice of meditation. And creative meditation, unlike traditional um, Indian meditation or Eastern meditation, where you empty your mind, uh, it's a process of filling your mind. Mm -hmm. And so rather than emptying yourself of everything, you're taking a quote or a verse 
um, and then you're thinking about that throughout the day and you're it, it, it's kind of a graphic image but it's like the cow chewing the cud so <laughs> yes. like the cow digests the grass it doesn't digest it it just chews it yeah. and then it has to go through these four stomachs and then it regurgitates it and chews it some more oh, wow. and so that's like the that's like I said a graphic image but uh, yeah you're taking the words and you're, you're thinking about it and then you're letting it sit and then you're bringing it back and you're thinking about like, okay, how do I put this into action? How do I bring this to life? Yeah, I actually do meditation every day as well. And that's mainly to um, get used to dealing with your thoughts, which I think is a really good practice in yeah. itself is to observe them and, and to understand how your mind works, which I think uh, if you're on your own a lot, is a very good, useful mm. practice. Um, and uh, what's your current life project that you've out there or is there anything coming Well, I'm writing a graphic novel, um, Journey to Ciudad Perdida, which is a real life adventure story um, based on my own experiences, trekking in the Colombian jungle. Um, yeah, so watch this space. Uh, it's a long project, but um, yeah, check out my Instagram. Um, or my website which is www.melaniewhelan.com and I've got work on there for sale. My picture book and prints and notebooks and little little comics collection as well. So. Oh, and it's coming out to Christmas. Yeah, oh. exactly. Yeah. <laughs> this comes out actually in November. So mm. yeah. And do, do you have... Um, do you have a website or Instagram? Yeah, my website is uh, Wacko Chaco, W H A C K O C H A C K O <laughs> dot com. And my Instagram is the same at Wacko Chaco. And uh, I have Christmas cards, art, and lots of books available. Yeah, and uh, I'm Moore McHugh, and I'm Splinister on Instagram and Twitter. And my website is splinister.com. I, I just had a story in uh, Monster Fun, which is uh, 2000 AD. Uh, I should say, actually, well, most people know Rebellion put out 2000 AD, but it's Rebellion's, um, it's like a, a comic for kids, which they're going to relaunch as a, a bi-monthly comic come April. And uh, that was a lot of fun, because I've never written for, um, uh, for that age group before. And then I've got a, a story of mine is appearing in it's just coming out a new uh, review of 300 years of Gothic fiction in Ireland. Wow. And John Connolly is editing it. Cool. So I'm really amazed that I'm, I'm grateful to be inside this book. <laughs> and that's coming out on the 28th of October and it's called Shadow Voices. And uh, yeah, and I've got lots of other things ticking along. So yeah, Instagram or Twitter, you can get me. Great. That's it, and thank you very much, and thank you to Bannon Slow Library for putting this on. We're really grateful for the support.